And welcome to the county facilities meeting. It's two o'clock. We do have a quorum here today. Um, first item on the, the agenda is to approve the minutes of the prior committee meeting. I wasn't in attendance, but uh, is there a motion to approve? Mr. Loeb? Mr. Simpson? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. The only item on today's agenda is the property that the, that the county currently owns located on Lower Warren Street. It's the D&G facility. Um, we have been discussing what options that we could look at since the beginning of, of uh, 2018. And we, we've looked at potentially releasing in the opportunity came, we had a discussion about potentially sell, selling the property uh, to the private sector. So <clears throat> there has been a uh, RFP sent out. We had one respondee to the RFP. I believe that that respondee also put a, a, a deposit down on, on the RFP. Um, that respondee is here today. He's at the meeting. Mr. Perkins, the owner of Perkins Recycling here, was the, the only respondee to the RFP. Um, so I'd like to open that up to the committee now to discuss the concept of selling the property. Give me a copy of this. I'll get you a copy of this. Uh, John uh, Stroud does have another meeting to attend to, but he has some comments he would like to share with the committee in regards to the property. All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, <clears throat> Mike for being so proactive, and if he saw something wrong, he was there to do something about it. Bravo to you. Um, the other thing is, is Peter had emailed me and said, you know, you know, basically, what do I have uh, about this particular site? So I said, listen, I'll throw together a few things of what I do have. It's not going to be full. It's kind of last minute. But, you know, some of the things that I may have, you may find interesting. So I'm going to share some of that with you. So first of all, let's take a look at the map so that we know what piece of property we're talking about. We're talking about, it's in red. And it's the county's own site. I will turn around and show you guys here. It's the county own site. But because of my conversation, I want to bring your attention to this little rectangular piece next to the railroad. Okay? And what is in blue is owned by New York State. That's the canal right away. Or, or, or what's in blue is owned by the uh, railroad company, which is in green is owned by New York State. It's the canal right away. Okay. But keep your mind on this little rectangular piece down there. All right, so what's outlined in red are about the 15 acres that the county owns. Okay. Now, <coughs> in that 15 acres, uh, what I came across, and some of you others have come across even more, I've come across what is not a deed, but this is the recorded agreement between the county and Sibagagi listing the easements and restrictions on that piece of property. Okay? Um, and what year was that? This uh, was at the agreement, what year was it, 1991, the county bought the property? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. 1991, May 16. <coughs> So I just want to, this is the, the easements on these 15 acres. So I just want to give you an idea. It's that page. I'm not going to go and list all the easements for you. I can make this a PDF and share this with you. More easements on the property. More easements. More easements. More easements. More easements. More easements. All right, you get the picture. I could go through all of them, but it is the list of easements and restrictions. Which means what? What? It, what oh, these go with the land. So what? The list of easements, meaning what? What we can do with the property? And well, for example, what we this, cannot do let me just, you know, along with the utility easements and civic agis easements and access easements and anybody that goes to the property has access easements and they have to be like 40 feet wide. I mean, if you're interested, I'll PDF this and you will find all the easements and all the details you want to know. I just want you to know that this exists. 
Oh, okay. So, um, so the other thing too is that anything that we do with the map anything we may do over on what they call the main property over here you have to provide access to the site for whatever gets done on this any future development whatever it is that has there's easements saying that you have to provide at least a 40 foot wide path someplace on that property to get the here okay along with many other things um all right now let me bring your attention because we've been talking about the county's piece of property here's the county's piece of property and then there's this funny rectangular piece of property still owned by Sibagagi, right in the middle on the south side of the county's property what's interesting there is what i found uh, as, as you know, we've done a couple of studies, lots of maps, a BOA study, and a waterfront residential study. And part of that, I have some subcategories. Deed restrictions is one of them. Okay. I also have, I'll come back to deed restrictions. I have uh, human exposure controls. EPA analysis, groundwater migration, um, emails of, uh, from St. Clair, from BASF of potential reuses, maps, DEC, institutional controls, and site inventory. But what's interesting, and I've drawn your attention to that rectangular piece because we've made the argument, well, this, this piece that the county owns, it, it's it, you know, it's east of the site, and so it wasn't part of the heavy pollution efforts. Well, interesting, when you look at um, the um, deed restrictions, the deed restrictions that go with this site also apply to that rectangular piece which is in the middle of the county. And here's a little bit of what it says. Residual subsurface contamination remains at the property. They're talking about those properties that are still owned by BASF, formerly Sibagog. Due to the presence of contaminants in the subsurface, final corrective measures for this property require the performance of certain post-remedial obligations. So, if you go by uh, extension, that concept may still apply to the county's own property. Because that rectangular piece, which we've tried to argue, well, that wasn't part of the really contaminated site, that is included in the area that there is potential for subsurface pollution. So, um, there's this and there's a lot more. Um, I think when we were doing these studies and the Queensbury market value of the property by the way is about 2.9 million um, both Stu Baker our senior planner for the town of Queensbury and Chris Round one of the executives for Chase and Companies. Both said that when we were doing the study, there were references to the restrictions on the county-owned property. You know, Chris Brown says, I saw them, but our focus wasn't on the county-owned property. Our focus has been what can we do with what we call the main property. <coughs> And there are some things that we can do, but it would be restricted as what we can do. But I think the one thing that stood out to me was the number and the definition and the 
well-defined number of easements. And again, the, what I showed you wasn't the deed, that's the list of easements and restrictions. So I just wanted you to know that this stuff is out there and I can get this to you electronically or what have you, but I just wanted you to know it's there. And that's what Peter kind of wanted me to share that with you. Yeah, can I ask you, the, the little smaller triangle piece, what was that designated? I tried to find out what I could. Why is that separate? One person told me, and I haven't verified it yet, that that was the site of a contaminated pile at one time. So BASF had that carved out of what they were going to give to the county because it still had a pile of contamination of it, which has since, I was told, has been removed. So that parcel, at least surface and up, might be fine. Uh, but they're also saying subsurface. Uh, yeah. But so my question is, they sold the county bought that rectangle. No, no, no. Oh, the yeah, owns, stuff still owns they, it. They own it. Yeah. Okay. So we only own the seven. We own around it, but it's interesting. Acres, you say? Well, some people have said, boy, if the county could buy that rectangular piece, whoever bought this other piece, or maybe subdivided it from the county and bought a subdivision part. I'll uh, be able to have direct access to the railroad, and that'd be an advantage. So why is that piece there? So I told you what I was told, but I need to get it verified. That's why that piece is carved out. But there's more to be, more knowledge we need for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman? Sure. John, are you still all set? Yeah, I just Thank wanted you. to give you a quick overview. And, and John and I have spent some time speaking about this issue of an understanding that John was kind enough to, to give me his study, um, of which he's correct. Um, this was part of the original Superfund site. Um, there were test wells, and I determined this from uh, the record that's being held at Crandall Library of the uh, EPA and DEC um, investigations and remediation work they did. And I think I mentioned this before, but there were test wells uh, dug throughout this property, the Seba property that's there now, uh, as well as uh, wells, I think one or two on our property. All the information that I was able to gather was there was no contamination that needed remediation under our property based on what those test wells revealed. And John is right, that, that little rectangle is carved out if my memory holds true, it was a retention pond. It could have very well been from uh, runoff uh, of the parking area, but it was a retention pond that was deemed um, more contaminated than the rest of the, uh, the site. And uh, for some reason, we didn't take it over. It's probably a good thing that we didn't. Um, but there are, as John mentions, uh, there are easements, um, and there are a, a number of deed restrictions uh, I can't say that I understand everything that's part of the legal documents that go along with that, but as I read it, if there's no limitations to future development other than it can't be done such that it allows for residential use or use for a hospital or something to that effect. But um, industrial use is approved, uh, and as well as I believe um, some commercial space is approved use. There are restrictions about removing soil and removing pavement. Um, and those restrictions are that that soil needs to be tested, and if it's deemed contaminated, then it has to be disposed of properly. But to my knowledge, as I read uh, the restrictions of the deed, there's nothing to that effect that precludes any further development. So um, I guess I, I would like to defer to Mary, because I know Mary has done some more research into this and reading if it's appropriate to uh, have you pitch in a little bit about the restrictions and our ability. Sure, of course. So the deed actually has the restrictions um, <coughs> built right into it um, and Supervisor Wild is correct. There are restrictions on what the property can be used for. Um, it says industrial purposes only and it does carve out recycling. It does say that specifically. Um, like it was also said, the asphalt cannot be disturbed and neither can the building where the building sits because they haven't tested under those 
areas yet and they have a strong suspicion that if any of that was disturbed then we would also be looking at far more contamination. Um, there are restrictions on building and what you can do, especially with water. Um, they would want any water tested if whatever your operation was was going to be using water. Um, and there are other um, restrictions as well. There was a, a deed notice filed on the property as well, um, which carries more restrictions in terms of allowing the state to come in and run tests and um, do things if someone wants to change the use of the property. Um, they go through different tests that they would do and I am by no means an expert in those specific tests. So um, I don't know if there's specific questions on that or if... If I may add just one thing. Um, I also had conversations with the EPA and that was really spawned by uh, something that was in the paper about uh, going through some phase three final approval of uh, of this site and it really wasn't the site that was further down the river where there's some remediation being done. But uh, the DEC conveyed to me that there were no actions or concerns at this time on the property. So there wasn't being actively monitored, there was no active uh, investigations other uh, then uh, recently in the last few weeks or maybe the last month uh, when there was a hydraulic oil spill by the current uh, person who leases it from his excavator uh, and they came in and had an environmental team, Kevin can help with this, but they did um, do remedial work to clean that up and we don't have approval yet, I guess what Kevin's saying that, that the materials all been tested and deemed clean. That's the only EPA or, or DEC action that I've heard of, and prior to that, there were none. Mr. Gary. Yeah, just a quick question. So they've done a, a phase one and phase two cleanup of the property? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand what phase one and phase two uh, is, but... The phase one is where they go in and uh, walk the property and look at for contaminants. Phase two is when they drill the wells. So I might have, well, I'll defer to Kevin about the and recent spill, <coughs> but they did have wells driven, driven into this site. Wells have been in on, that, on that property for years, uh, yeah. probably way back since he, got, he probably sold it off, even probably before that. Uh, I'm not sure how long that DEC has been testing that property, but it's been for an awful long time. What Mike's referring to with the hydraulic leak, that was a spill in the area that they do um, some of their recycling of, of their refrigerators and whatever else. And uh, DEC came in and tested the soil and said, you need to clean it up. Uh, MC, the uh, current occupant had MC Environmental come in and uh, remove all the existing soil in that area that DEC had pointed out. Uh, and we're just waiting on lab results of anything beyond that that have had migrated any further. And uh, the oil spill or the hydraulic oil spill. But we haven't gotten that back from DEC yet. So, and again, just to elaborate, I, I don't know how many wells were on our site, but there were multiple wells, and as I read the, the EPA documents that are in Crandall Library in the reference section, uh, there were no indications of contamination from what came out of those that required the remediation. I can't say it was completely clean because I didn't read to that level of detail, but what I was really focused on, was there an issue there? Some of the contaminants that were found were, and, and you're right, nothing that exceeded the level that they wanted it cleaned up. They, they still, and I think even the DEC report says this when they just closed it out, there still are contaminants in the ground, but they're below any type of level that concerns them anymore. Hello. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. When Steve Geige first moved out, there was an extensive agreement and arrangement between the city and our uh, sewer treatment facilities. And Steve Geige. But a lot of years have gone by since then. I know at one point uh, part of Steve Geige's system uh, broke down and excessive drainage came to our treatment plant. And, uh, I that, that's my memory, and there were fines involved. I'm wondering where that's, at least as of the end of your tenure, where we stand uh, with that. Uh, do we still have the drainage wells, which are constantly monitored? That's a question you'd have to ask the water and sewer superintendent. I haven't gotten any 
feedback during my 10 years from DTC in regards to any contaminations or any violations that are associated with the Cedar Guide uh, facility at that time. So you, as far as you know, there's no there's no well I, going on where there. I, that I don't know. I am not aware of it. Um, if I may, certainly, certainly if there was, there there would have been some discussion with DEC about that. If I may, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. from from what I heard from the DEC, um, the main site that was the Superfund site uh, that had all the work and the uh, the memory that captured groundwater, um, that isn't actively being monitored now because the effluent effluent is clean. Well it, to it, to whatever extent. It depends. All right, we're talking about the main site. <coughs> okay, this is the main site. Sheet water and groundwater flow went southward and you see these dots, these are collection wells. What I was told was that these collection wells all went to a primary treatment site right here on the north side of uh, which River Street, Lower Warren, until you get to Quaker Road, then it's called River. Don't ask. I don't know why. It's just this. So um, it was a pre-treatment site. And then it went from there. And there is still this direct connection over to the uh, Glens Falls wastewater treatment site. So for years, it got pre-treated, then sent to the Lunch Falls wastewater treatment for further treatment. Now, DEC and BASF are comfortable with the upper soils and the groundwater, and they are still monitoring. You'll see a couple of trailers over here. This is where the, the BASF hires these two guys to live and reside, and they continue doing the testing. So, but the testing has come to the point where DEC is satisfied that the upper soils are clean. It's, and so now the pretreatment is not being used anymore. So the groundwater is being still sent to the Lunchwell's wastewater treatment plant, but it is no longer having to have the pretreatment because it's been deemed fairly clean. But I'm going from memory to it says underneath the soils, and this is one of the things that BASF said with no basements, no residentials would be allowed here. They would consider some kind of industrial, and if you're going to put foundations in, then all that soil would have to be reinspected and so forth. There'd be other costly requirements to putting buildings in here. And um, but it's still getting treated and it's still being inspected. But this is the main site, not necessarily Warren County's own site. This is the main site. I don't think they're doing any testing anymore on Warren County's portion. This is all the portion to the west. Okay, so that's one story yeah. there. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I did ask John to, if, if he had some materials to just maybe help educate uh, us on, you know, the, the issues in, in, involved with this. Uh, unfortunately, I think counties uh, sometimes are confronted with uh, uh, pieces of property that they probably should never, ever sell or maybe initially ever have purchased. Uh, the, uh, this, I think, is the case here. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the liability when we, if we transfer ownership of this site, um, I question whether the liability can be transferred with the sale. I would argue that it probably cannot. Um, it may very well create uh, additional problems, additional liability problems, and, and the. We, uh, in 2012, uh, Judge Afrido and I think Paul Dusick, uh, uh, to their credit, I believe, uh, we passed a local law uh, in 2012. And, and the net uh, impetus for this law was to help 
protect the county from liability arising out of possible environmental contamination for which the county agreed to be responsible for an agreement made with Seba Geigy Corporation at the time of acquisition of certain real property, and, and that's the property described here. So uh, my, my concern is, is liability <coughs> for the county, that, that, that we more entities this is pushed off to, the greater possibility for lawsuits, the greater parties involved. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, somewhere along the line, I think someone told me that the, the, the mother corporation, BASF, uh, did not, uh, it had no interest in selling uh, the properties there to people. That, that they would enter into lease agreements, okay? And, and, and that being said, what, what this major international corporation is saying is we choose not to sell for a reason because they recognize by selling they open themselves up to significant liability. So I would, uh, I would argue that uh, uh, a sale is a mistake unless we have fairly ironclad uh, agreements, uh, communication with with DEC, State of New York, uh, and uh, the, the uh, and I would maybe ask Mary the question. I mean, uh, do, but what about the liability? Uh, you know, do, do we do we lessen our liability when we sell it? Do we increase our liability? Can liability be transferred? So you can't ever rid the county of its liability under a Superfund site. No party can actually transfer that liability. Um, so Shiba Geigy would be responsible or their parent company would be responsible for whatever Superfund um, contamination was there when they were the owner. The county would then become responsible for whatever contamination happened while the county was the owner. The only thing that you can try to do is assign indemnity. So basically what that means is you're still responsible for your pollution and you're still going to have to pay the cost of remediating it but then you can go and sue whatever party has indemnified you and try to get them to pay the cost to clean up. Um, but you can never get rid of your liability. <coughs> let, me, let me pose one more question if I can, Mike. Uh, the, uh, you know, we've all purchased homes in our lifetime and the, the last thing we end up purchasing is a, is a title insurance policy. Uh, now, uh, and we do that because we want to ensure that substance previous ownership, everything is, is clean, it's in order, and it, uh, uh, do you, it, it, based on what you said, I, I, I just said, I, I would think that the ability to, to get that kind of insurance would be next to impossible, or very, very expensive. I, I don't know the answer yeah. to that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Sure, well, thank you. Um, I, I think if I heard what Mary said, the liability stays with the owner when the issue occurred. Is that correct? Correct. So any contaminants that were a result of Shiba Gaigi's operation on our property goes back to Shiba Gaigi. What we're responsible for is what we did to the property or what our, whoever we've leased the property to will have done. Is that correct? In that, layman's terms? That is correct, yeah. Except for Sibagagi doesn't exist. BASF. Okay. BASF. BASF purchased. And they had all the liabilities. And you're right. They told us that they could never sell it. They could lease it. They could allow use of it. But the liability is theirs for after. On their side. On, on their side. On Not the main side. Not necessarily for ours. Yeah, right. Okay. But the same holds true. They own that property originally. And Mary, please correct me if I'm wrong. So if the contamination is a result, if the, whatever they find is <coughs> what was deposited there by the Siba Gaigi operation, now Hercules owns that liability. But if that migrates to our property or to whoever we potentially assign this property to, it still goes back to Siba and Hercules. Yes, I do want to caution you though because the county did take on indemnity for Siba Geigy, so they could then sue the county for their cost to clean up. 
<coughs> like circular logic. But Say that again. So they would be responsible for the initial cleanup costs to remediate the pollution, but then because the county indemnified them, they could then sue the county for the cost of the cleanup. What year was that? Thanks. Just one thing though. Mary, have you seen the easements? Yes. I have. I mean, to me, I'm not a lawyer. They're mind boggling. <laughs> huh? Yeah. And it seems like that'd be very difficult to unravel. I mean, draw them out on a map and I don't know. Are, are they transferable, Mary? The easements with the deed? Yeah. Easter with the deed. And it's my understanding during the RFP process that the, that those questions were raised in the RFP and uh, in part of the RFP process was an understanding that there was a willingness to accept those responsibilities when they responded to the RFP. So I think from a legal standpoint, being able to transfer easements, um, any deed restrictions, any DEC requirements, that was that was included in the RFP and, and the existing um, individual from Perkins Recycling was willing to uh, understood that when he responded to the RFP. So I guess my point is that it, 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 it may be included if the board decides to uh, sell this piece of parcel um, that uh, that all of those restrictions and easements are included in the contract itself. So we're, co we're covered in, in that respect. And we're just in, we were talking initially about just selling that one parcel of land where the uh, recycling facility was located and it's my understanding that there's no intentions to disturb the ground soil below that facility. So I just want to include that. So I guess my question is we've spent a good deal of a year trying to figure out what was the best opportunity uh, for the county in regards to this facility, whether to uh, renew the current lease, whether to extend and then extend that or potentially sell, sell the property. So I, I think that that's where I'd like to focus this discussion on how does the board feel, what are our options. We know at one of our facilities meetings that it was brought to our attention that the building is going to need a new roof. That's one thing. That's anywhere from a hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a new roof. <coughs> if we retain ownership. If we have if we can transfer th through the deep process in a contract our liabilities and risks. Why wouldn't we undertake that? And the other option that I think we have if we are to uh, sell the property is we're going to put the property back on the tax rolls in the town of Queensbury and we're going to put some money into the county coffers. My perspective on it is that <coughs> if the owner is willing to accept contract language that that the county attorney would, would put together that would include these easements and deed restrictions, why wouldn't we get out from underneath that building? Why wouldn't we want to continue with the cost associated with it? I, I would argue that uh, long term we, uh, we're going to end up uh, in court. Uh, we're going to be defending a, uh, a lawsuit. A uh, $100,000 roof will seem insignificant in comparison uh, when we uh, so the part the, the, the based on the circumstances of this piece of property and a super fun status it, it just is uh, this is a this is an accident waiting to happen and to sell a property for four hundred thousand dollars that's that's nonsense. That's 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 penny ante change. It uh, when when we get get sued for forty million, I, I would defer the legal status absolutely of absolutely. your position yep. to an attorney, not your personal feelings in regards to this this topic. 
I put my personal opinions and my personal choice. Sure. Yeah. And I'll make them, okay? Gary? Yeah, I mean, if you base it on your logic, Peter, mm -hmm. then no town would ever participate in cleaning up brownfield sites. Now, we cleaned up brownfield sites in our community and partnered with the state and got a, got a sign off from DEC that the site was cleaned up and used. And that sounds like this parcel of land has the same uh, same uh, moniker with that, that it's been cleaned up and it's okay as long as you don't. And then the only reason why they don't want you to take the pavement up is because you'd have to test underneath what's underneath the blacktop. But I mean, I would have no problem selling this property if you had a willful buyer. And I can't see where, I really don't understand your concerns about something happening in the future would come back on us. I, I, I don't get that. If it's, if it's deemed that it's cleaned up, and that you can use it for certain things. Why do you feel the liability comes back to the county? And that's just my... Well, the word indemnify uh, kind of concerns me, that we agreed in 1991 to indemnify. That sounds like a big legal word to me, as well as a very expensive legal word to me. What does indemnify mean? Can we put a, dollar tag? Can we put a dollar tag on that? Chairman, thank you. Uh, you know, just to uh, kind of expand on some of the background information that I have. <coughs> Part of the deed restrictions say that any kind of future development has to have EPA and DEC review and approval. So that would imply to me that it's going to be um, monitored and viewed because it was adjacent to a Superfund site. Yeah. Mike, you, you indicated that you, you reached out to EPA and the is it possible to get anything in writing from these folks, uh, just kind of giving us a general determination, a conclusion? I, I did. I, I reached yeah. out. I had multiple <coughs> conversations with the DEC, not with the EPA, okay. um, because the DEC is more closer involved with this um, right now. And um, they referred me for a legal opinion. They gave me their impressions about what was going to, what, what the potential liabilities were going forward, which I've conveyed should be minimal. We talked about the groundwater, how it slopes towards the river. Um, we talked about the test wells that were in there that tr uh, proved not to be concerning enough to take additional action. Um, their um, conveyance to me was that, similar to what Mary said, if it is um, Sibagagi material uh, that migrates to our site, then Sibagagi would be held responsible because they are the permit holder uh, with the EPA and the DEC. So, I, and I just can, I, I don't have the legal background to say one way or another, but the impression that I got was that the risks were minimal <laughs> for anyone to move forward with this um, pursuant to the EPA and the DEC investigation about what's going on with that property and what's underneath that membrane. But I, I'll defer to Mary again. Mary, I don't know, did we ever um, get a, a legal opinion from some others regarding um, the liability issue, mm -hmm. indemnification, if I'm using the word correctly? <coughs> yes, and that was what I just conveyed to the committee about how the liability goes back to the owner, but we have indemnified. Um, I don't know if you were looking. Well, and maybe just to take it a step further, and I'm, Jack, tell me if I'm going the wrong way, but maybe we should ask the bidder whether or not that that's acceptable to take that indemnification and our liability and might settle this conversation. Would it uh, make sense to reach out to the bidder's attorney or Mr. Perkins is here today, maybe he's willing to uh, answer that question or he wants to talk to his attorney in regards to that? I'd like to talk to my attorney about it. But certainly when you submitted your bid, you were aware of some of these DEC issues oh, and yes. your willingness oh, to yes. accept the deed with these deed restrictions uh, in, in, in regards to the, the, the purchase of the property. How many years were you there before you moved out of that yeah, location? I was there 11, 12 years before I... And you were paying the county $8,000 a month. Right. And right now we, we have... I wanted agreement. to expand. I wanted to buy it. For 4000 And now your willingness to buy the property and expand your operations down there. Right. 
Claudia, you had your hand up. Thanks. I had two two questions. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to go the route that Supervisor Gary was mentioning about getting DEC sign off through a brownfield program so that we can? It's my understanding that they would then say, okay, it's been cleaned up, you can sell it, and that somehow limits your liability. They've already signed up. <laughs> They have? To what? To the county? Well, I don't know. Okay. That, that would be one question. And my other question is, can we, if we were to put something in the deed or the contract that would survive the closing, would that supersede state law that says because we owned it, we are a potentially responsible party forever? Can we, can we shift our liability? that we agreed to for whatever reason back whenever that was. Can we shift that to them legally or not? You cannot contract away your liability. You can contract the indemnity, which is just paying the cleanup costs once you're sued by the responsible party. So we could shift it over to a person? We, we, we could. could shift the indemnity. Correct. So if I may, Claudia, I'm sorry, are you done? Mm -hmm. um, there's no active cleanup now. So the only reason there would be an active cleanup if the soils were disturbed. I'm not Claudia, do you think that's a reasonable assumption? Is there potential contamination here on the record? I mean is that or is it just a not from vector? the not from the Sheba site. There's uh, as I believe Kevin said, there are some contaminants there, but they're below threshold levels. On the site we own. On, on the site? Or I, 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 I believe it's on the site that we own, and that's why the pavement, I think one of the restrictions was the pavement not being disturbed. Well, is it? We have to test it. If we're going to disturb it, we have to test it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anything oh. Whatever's disturbed needs to be tested and, and um, disposed of properly if it's if outside. If to be contaminated. If found to be contaminated. Let's not say you have to rip up the whole property. Right. It's just whatever. Right. It doesn't disturbed. say there's anything there. If you do, be aware that if you rip that up, you've got to test it because then you may have to clean it so up. So if you dig footings, it alone, if you dig footings, everybody's happy. Then you, the, the dirt that you pull up for footings for a foundation for a building would need to be tested. You don't. I don't believe you'd go through the whole site. Actually, I, I want to add on to that if I could a little bit. You, if if they start digging underneath the pavement and disturb or found potentially contaminated soil, uh, DEC is most likely going to make them chase that soil. Okay. So they'll continue to dig until they're out of that soil, if it's above their thresholds. Just an example of that, when we did exit 18 uh, reconstruction, we ran into that at the mobile station uh, that used to be on uh, the off-ramps to exit 18 northbound. Uh, and we had to dig for quite a few ways to remove some of the contaminated soil that was there. Mr. Whitehead. Um, so in 1991, when Seba Geigy <coughs> decided to ex sell this to the county and accept uh, an agreement to indemnify them, they realized that the county had deep pockets. Mm -hmm. So if anything were to go awry years down the road, say, multi-million dollar, billion dollar potential multi house type things come down. They they know they're going to have to take care of it, but then they can sue us. Now we can sue the people maybe that we sell it to. So you better make sure that they have at least as deep a pocket as we have, or else those attorneys are just going to go right for us and, and right for Bass F. I mean, they're not going to really want to deal with Perkins or, or anybody else. There's just not enough money there. So I believe you ought to make sure that, just like Steve Agaghi did, that you make sure that whoever you sell it to has deep enough pockets to take on the responsibility you're trying to voice on. Are we talking about one particular parcel, just the property underneath the building, not the rest of the liability? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with your uh, opening statement about the uh, uh, considering the viability of selling the property. Right now, there are restrictions uh, on disturbing the surface, as we just discussed a moment ago. If we sold the property 
and said, here's the surface. These are the restrictions. If you get into that, you are creating the liability. I guess I'm posing this as a question of, could this be done? Because right now, there seems to be no problem with the property. The property of, of, if we use it, if we sold it to a, uh, another party and everything remained the same, there would be no, prob no problems. I think we could protect ourselves because we're living with it right now. Whatever happens, we have to pay for it. I can't imagine that we could, uh, uh, the future owner would indemnify us saying, don't worry, we'll cover any costs. So it's going to come to Warren County, but perhaps we could protect ourselves by saying, we'll sell you the property, but if you disturb that pavement, you won't. I don't know if that's true, but I wonder if that's something we could do to protect ourselves. Mary's answer was no. no. The, the liability always stays with the person who pollutes the property. So if, even if they disturbed it, the liability rests with the party who put the pollution there. The only thing we could do is sell down the property and say you cannot disturb the asphalt or under the building. That's the only way we could prevent that from happening. Chairman got over. Yeah. Uh, you know, my experience has been it's always in the best interest of the buyer and seller to have a complete investigation. Because the specter of these kinds of issues, you can loop on this forever. Uh, you just can't. Uh, you don't want to play ostrich with this kind of thing either because uh, you don't want anybody getting hurt and sick or whatever. And so, you know, I think a uh, more thorough investigation, particularly if we have some interest, it doesn't have to be a decision, but some interest in selling it or some interest in people buying a complete investigation will help the decision-making process enormously. Because somebody mentioned the Brownfield program, unless it's changed, I think the Brownfield program has to be cleaned with all three release conditions. But then there's the voluntary cleanup program, which is more of a Rebecca standard, a risk-based standard. And it sounds to me like some of the covenants in DEC that you mentioned, I have no familiarity with this particular site, but they talked about that they wanted to review what the use was going to be, right? But that's um, what's called a risk-based assessment in terms of uh, whether it continues as a manufacturing use as opposed to a children's playground, right? So I think that, you know, if there's some interest on the board as far as selling this, that uh, I think a complete investigation of the uh, material that exists today plus uh, a uh, higher level investigation is really in order because if if it comes back totally clean, you know, maybe it's got a very expensive, very, very, you know, highly valued piece of property, right? Uh, and, and, and I think you're going to want to know that. And if there are issues out there, well, you're going to want to know that, but certainly the seller's going to want to know that as well. So I think it's the unknown here that's going to uh, handicap us uh, in, our, in our process and a more complete investigation. And you don't have to spend a ton of money all at once. You can, you can approach this in stages, right? You can have a, a type of <coughs> inquiry that could take, take but a few weeks and I don't know, maybe in a few weeks, maybe no, but let's say <laughs> by spring, a few weeks uh, that would answer some fundamental questions. DEC would even help you uh, develop a, uh, an outline of an investigation where you, you might spend a little bit and then, and then if you were encouraged, you'd spend some more. And then by the end of the process, you would um, have a, a good picture, a good picture of where you were here. And, uh, and it just would help, I think. Body. And if we're going to sell it, then we'll have a baseline. So if there's any pollution that happens afterwards, we can say, hey, that wasn't pollution that we added. That's something new. Right, because I think what Mary's, if I can say, I think what Mary's referring to is what's called, we're part of the title trail. Or what uh, DC and the state would refer to as we're part of the title trail now. <coughs> Whether there are obligations to go along with that or not uh, depends upon you know, the evaluation of what role we played within that title trail. Mr. Leggett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry for coming into the meeting late, so I, I probably missed what's on the table here. I did hear $400,000.
And um, I take it that's not for the, all 14 acres, correct? No, the intent was to subdivide the property. Yeah, and right now all 14 acres is, is assessed at $2.86 million. So there, there seems to be a big difference between the two on, on the, the value. So if we're to be stewards of, of um, the um, county residents here and their, their assets, Seems like four hundred thousand is, um, is is a low price, and we have not even discussed um, how we would replace the facilities um, that for our office of emergency service vehicles that we have in there, and that also comes with a price tag as well. So just one point those out, Kevin. I, I just wanted to add on. Uh, I haven't gotten the final report yet. I won't receive it till Monday. Uh, but I was pushing the gentleman who I told you at the last meeting would be doing an appraisal for us on the property. Uh, again, I don't have a final report, but the number he had just given me just before I walked in this meeting was his appraisal is going to be about six hundred sixty thousand dollars for that piece of property. I was going to say, Claudia. What? I, I, I'm sorry. I, don't, I didn't look at the RFP, but. How, what is yeah, the exact size of the lot, and is, has it already been officially subdivided? No, it hasn't been subdivided yet. That's got to go through the process at Queensbury. Okay. And what is the size? 14.8 acres. That's the whole thing, right? Yes. This, yes. The subdivision part would be 10.3 acres. 10.3 acres. And the county would retain 4.5, which would be our uh, where our shop is at the south end. So 400,000 is a far cry from its assessed value. Even at 14 acres, we take off the board. The assessed value includes the entire parcel. Right. No, we're subdividing. Yeah, but you're talking about selling them all of all of the parcel, except for four acres. So should we be getting almost all of the assessed well, value? We'll have an appraisal. Go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, there was a gentleman I met by the name of Jack Kelly. Jack Kelly's um, involved with the um, IDA. He's a business development realtor kind of guy. From my experience, or from what I was told, he was the one that helped bring global foundries into our region. Um, his comment to me was that industrial land in the town of Queensbury is basically going for $50,000 a acre. That's what um, I believe is uh, for the industrial park just off of exit 18. So, um, you know, we're basically talking 10 acres which would equate to about $500,000 just for the rolling. So I think the appraisal is probably close to what I would say, based on the research I've done, appears to be reasonable as compared to the assessed value. And I just add one more comment, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've, I've had multiple conversations with uh, Mr. Perkins. Uh, I, one thing we need to take into account is the pace of government versus the pace of business. And what I would like to do is be able to possibly come out of here today with an indication of what would it take for us to move forward today. Not necessarily a decision to move forward today, but what would it take for us to move forward today? And uh, allow that to be conveyed to Mr. Perkins so he can make a decision because he has a move to make. I think I'll let him speak. I'd like to say something. I bid for 100000 I put 10% down. I told you I would come up to 40000 I'm going to have to put in three hundred to 350000 in that property. The office is shot. There's no scales there. I've got to bring down or put in $75,000, $80,000 scales. The roof is shot. I've had, it's going to cost me about 350000 So what you said, 700000 <coughs> that's what I'm putting in. Any other questions or comments from the I board? Just, Peter? Thank you, Jack. I, Mary, would it be possible to get uh, that 91 agreement, uh, the indemnification uh, agreement, get, would it be possible to get a copy of that? Sure, I have a copy with me. I can make copies. Okay, great. And then uh, secondly, does uh, BASF, do they have any veto power on us uh, moving that around? Uh, I believe that they do. They do. So do they have a veto on that? 
it looks as though we need to ask them for permission to assign any of the rights that were in our contract to a new um, buyer. Okay, so they they do have a right to veto it. That's what it sounds like, huh? Okay. Thank you. Molino. Just one question to Mary. Isn't that 1991? Does it say on the property? It does. I don't know if I believe it. It says a dollar. Sure, they have a dollar. <laughs> of course. Oh, it's a great decision. Because it's probably worth less than a dollar. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mr. Chairman, I just want to, you know, I, I, I wanted to kind of go through this briefly, but I'm, I'm going to try to do it really quick because what I like to do is understand consequences and what are the pros and cons. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's $400,000 that the county doesn't have today. Um, we get to keep our portion of the property for the DMV. Our property goes back on tax rolls. The buyer's committed to making improvements. Um, we have the dollars to create space for the new EMS equipment, and I, Kevin can convey this to you uh, better than I can, but it's less than the price of what we would be able to sell the property for to find new space for the EMS equipment. Our liability is down. We don't have to spend $100,000 or so for a roof. If we wanted to maintain that building. Um, there is a, a negative in the liability we talked about, but there is an existing business there that it might displace some workers. There's another kind. But that was my overall perception of what this opportunity is. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Mr. Perkins, thank you. Uh, I think your comments were, uh, were great, appropriate. Uh, you're a good business person, and thank you for attending, okay? I, uh, the, uh, uh, I think what Mary just said I think is extremely important. Why would Sibagaygi sell Warren County this property for one dollar? Why? And we all know the answer to that, okay? Because it's got some inherent fundamental long-term liability pollution problems. A dollar? Come on. <laughs> a couple more comments and I'll close the meeting at I mean, 3 o'clock. Supervisor McDevitt, it, it might not have been a dollar. I mean, that could just be what was in the seat, but that's all there. It has a bad You're right. Okay. Good, good point. Good point. I, I, I would like to see, as far as um, Supervisor Wild's oh, comments about we what would that. we say to him today, I, I would like to see the county pursue some sort of DEC program to get it, get a little bit of green bill of health clean bill of health before we convey it off to some other person and let them go in their merry way. I mean, do we not have the resources in your department, Kevin, to pursue that? To talk with PEC? Sure. Any, any one of us. We've got $10 million. Well, you have your new environmental person. But, <laughs> correct, but they're not going to go out there and do testing. I'll, no. I'll, t I'll take one more comment. I think Mr. Whitehead, then we'll close. He's not on the committee, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Bill, uh, you know, it's yeah. 3 o'clock, we can continue to okay. talk about it. I, I just wanted to, to, uh, to comment. Um, <laughs> Wait, <laughs> Excuse me? I just lost it. No, um, oh, I know. Rather than, rather than putting the money into a, an environmental study, uh, since the next step would be to um, declare this parcel surplus to our needs, and this is under County Law 215, and uh, and it requires two-thirds vote. Um, if you cannot obtain the two-thirds vote, then why spend the money? If, on the other hand, you take the next step, you can get the this declared surplus on the two-thirds vote. Then I think you know, that Ms. Kramer's suggestion would be the next step after that. I'm just saying, do the one that doesn't cost any money first as a taxpayer. Thank you. For that. Mr. Globin and Mr. Leggett. Yes, uh, I uh, go along with uh, Chairman and uh, Supervisor Bramer as far as, but it would be good to get a baseline testing of this property, and then I would like to see us move ahead and uh, sell it. Mr. Leggett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As, as Chairman of Public Safety Criminal Justice um, Committee, I know that this will come before my committee, and which many of you are on, about where do we place the. the Office of Emergency Service Vehicles. A new facility for, for that is going to be costly, and I would say that we dedicate at least um, 
up to $300,000 of the proceeds of any sale towards uh, alternate facilities for those uh, vehicles and equipment. Mr. Leggett, how did you come up with that estimate? 300,000? Uh, this has been kicked around here on around the table. $300,000? Yeah. You know what? How's those equipment that have been sitting outside for six months? So, right now in, t in the town Chester, we're looking to expand the highway garage, uh, and we've come in at $180,000 uh, for, for that already. That would just about suit the um, this equipment here, and that is for an unheated building without any other facilities in it. So I just took base cost and added some to it. Maybe we could find something to lease a lot cheaper. You know, we, we sell a capital asset so that we become renters. Like well, we're selling a capital asset, which I wouldn't really call an asset. The, the facility is being maintained by the county. Uh, but we're, what we're attempting to do is get out from underneath the liability that exists there, put it back on the tax rolls, and add stability to uh, a company at Perkins Recycling. I don't see that building as an asset. I think I look at that building as a drain on the county coffers with deed restrictions. Oh, oh, okay, but if and when it does get sold, the proceeds go and be applied for um, suitable facilities for emergency vehicles. We'll deal. We'll talk about that if it gets sold. But to come, uh, but I, I, I'm just thinking three hundred thousand dollars is an astronomical number to be throwing out there. Mrs. Bramer? And I was going to say we have county assets on our campus that are underutilized and could use that money to renovate them, i.e. the county jail, the old county jail. Now we're getting a little bit off the track. Is it, uh, so is it a, if I'm hearing from the committee and I haven't heard from all of the members, I, I think that there's some more legwork need to be done in order to advance this to the sale. Personally, I think we should sell the property. I think it's in the best interest of, of the county to do that. However, I don't know how this board here feels. I've heard a lot of discussions, a lot of concerns about liabilities, DEC, EPA. Uh, we've had two existing businesses there for many, many years. Uh, what do I tell this gentleman here that's sitting here? W what do you people want to do? Mr. Simpson. I, I'm in favor of selling it with uh, certain concerns. I need to tell you the concerns I have. Um, I don't want to increase any contamination in the environment. I don't want to put another entity in the situation of not dealing with the contamination the proper way. I don't know how to do that. I'm not an expert in facilitating this, but I just don't know the best path forward. I don't want to contaminate anybody. The river I don't, I don't know what's there. I'm not even able to qualify, quantify um, if it's good or bad or okay. That's, if something conta is contaminated, I'm concerned. We have the highest cancer rate in this county and uh, in the state. And okay. it concerns me. Mr. Lyle, Mr. Chairman, so if I might suggest, so then why don't we put these restrictions in a purchase contract in a deed? says you cannot disturb, like we're under those restrictions also, you cannot disturb the pavement, you cannot disturb other things that are there other than maybe replacing the scale, right? And, you know, rehabbing some buildings of roofs, right? And other than that, it requires the full approval of whomever. True. I've been thinking about that actually for the last 20 minutes or so and thinking about all the traffic going in there and I've been there I know all about the pavement and the concrete that stuff deteriorates it has a lifespan you increase traffic you're gonna have to do something that blacktop so it, you know I don't know how to handle that I, I don't know does that mean in 10 years we deal with the contamination if it's our property because it's not gonna last forever right. and um, because it's our property we'll is it gonna be possible to have to repave that thing. is it gonna be contained correctly in private you know, that's just some of the things. I, I'm just unqualified to talk about contamination. And I 
Mr. McGowan. I have to say I really enjoyed the discussion amongst all of us here because it is a, a major um, a major endeavor that uh, we have the possibilities now. But I have to agree with uh, with, uh, with Craig uh, on his thinking on replacement. One of my concerns was is to replace what we need for our emergency equipment. I think that we need, we need to look into what we're going to do that and the cost of uh, if it happens to be a new building or you know um, you mentioned a, a lease uh, you know it I would think that we want to keep this in our conversations of trying to figure out what we're going to do there because if it turns out to be a wash deal um, I, I don't find it favorable. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just for the committee's advisement, over the past four years we have spent a number of dollars. We hired an engineer for the committee's recommendation, and we do have all the numbers and designs and blueprints for a facility that could accommodate our stuff. So down the road, if you get to a point and you need all those numbers, you'd like to know what they are, I'm glad to supply them. Could you tell us for the record what that cost is? It depends on which way we go. Originally, we talked about a pole barn, Kevin knows that, and then we talked about enclosing a pole barn, and then we talked about a pre-manufactured building, and all the way up to a stick-built building that the engineer said was three-quarters of a million dollars, down to a pre-manufactured one that could be assembled on site for $150,000, $175,000. So, in your opinion, what building would be your building of recommendation, and what would the cost be? I think you could use 200 to 225,000 as a very conservative number. Conservative? Okay. Um, any other comments? Uh, again, I heard from Mr. Simpson. I'd, I'd like to have some idea of how the board feels in regards to. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time of Mr. Perkins's time on this issue if, if there's not a consensus to sell the property. And I'm sure that he doesn't want to spend a lot of money on legality if there's not a consensus. So I guess we'll leave it at this that we'll adjourn and for further contemplation. Um, thank you for coming, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wild. I, I do have another issue I want to bring up that's okay. separate to the sale. All right. Uh, if you don't mind. You may have seen some pictures floating around. You may have uh, read my celebrity status in the newspaper. Um, our current operator in our building, um, I received a call on uh, Friday, I believe it's the 23rd, there's some pictures floating around. Um, pictures on the screen is basically what I saw when I drove up. It was cold that day, but what you see on the ground is not snow. It is that material that was being blown out of a window I can figure out how to use this. Um, at the, basically a second story height, it was blown out and basically just deposited on the ground. Um, this, uh, this material, I suspected, um, was probably such that it's very light. You can see this is a very calm day, and I suspected that it would be able to blow all over the property. I happened to go back. Uh, earlier this week and um, took a couple more pictures if I can get this to, to show up. This is where the, the DOT um, is using our property and the pavement for some, uh, was it testing or uh, examinations for uh, CDL drivers? Uh, it's, you know, my, my guess is maybe a few hundred feet, 700 feet or so away from the actual building where that pipe was. Um, this next picture in two will show you what it looks like. All this little fuzzy stuff here um, and here is that plastic material. So uh, this is, um, in my mind, uh, a disrespectful way to operate um, as someone who's leasing uh, our property and our building. They have done some remediation. I know that uh, Kevin um, and his team have been over there to look at it. Got a picture of it, I believe, here somewhere. This one, oh, this one. Somebody can help me 
scroll down. Basically, what he did is he put another pipe in, extended it down, put it in a garbage can, and put some screen material over the top of it. Uh, I don't know, you guys feel it's working? When I saw that, I don't know if I can zoom in or not, but there was white material on top of the screening. Um, I had uh, I had an issue with this. I thought it was inappropriate. I've read our lease agreement. There's numerous things in the lease agreement that states that you should be not operating in anything that kind of creates any kind of nuisance or contamination to our site. And I wanted to bring this up because you've seen over the past few months pictures of what I've taken about the, the region, the area around, the uh, garbage and paper and plastic in the uh, weeds off the side of the pavement. Um, it's just not being maintained. And uh, one of the things I did ask for, and you may have seen in the very first picture, um, I asked him where the, where the garbage was coming from. And he said it was in his container that he was using, this, you know, it's a large container, garbage trash container. And I asked him to put um, some screening or something over to protect it. This was about two months ago, still not there. So I just wanted to bring this up to the committee. I felt personally as though it should be shut down. Uh, we're mitigating it now, but um, I've been tasked to renegotiate this person's lease, and uh, I'm not sure how much further I can go with this. Are you going to be sending Mr. Fingers a Christmas card? Or? No, no, I, I don't believe that that'd be appropriate. Mr. Chairman, uh, you were looking for uh, opinion of the committee. You have three opinions. I believe you said you gave an opinion seller or not. Uh, why don't we ask the rest of the committee members and then and you'll have your answer. I've tried to ask that two or three times and I haven't gotten an answer. <clears throat> I'll go first. I believe we should um, thoroughly investigate a sale as long as we can, us and the prospective buyer understands the um, environmental liabilities and the implications of that going forward. He has the willingness in talking to his attorney to understand the language that Mary will put in there to protect the county's interest. I would support that too, also. Mr. McDevitt. Uh, no. Mr. Simpson. I just can't resist but to congratulate Molly Khan. I never thought that I'd see that type of bag recycled. <laughs> That is, that takes a lot of work right there. That's reunion, Mr. That's reunion. The only thing I had in my car was one of these. That took some work. Mr. Garrity. I say sell it, but I think you ought to be able to find, there ought to be some sort of report already done that says that they gave the okay, like if you read this EPA thing, somebody's done some testing on the site. Mm -hmm. Just find the documents and uh, give it to our attorney to uh, review. Okay, Mr. Leggett. I'd be open to sale. Okay. Mr. Frazier. I'd be open to sale. Mr. Beatty. Uh, I would too, and I'd like to make a caveat. Um, I think we ought to follow the correct process, which is let's right. have it declared a surplus. Uh, yeah. Because if, to me, we're kind of doing it backwards here. So I would recommend that we do the correct steps, which is first the two thirds of the board declare it or not declare it. Either way, they vote. You know, uh, as surplus or not. Okay. And then, and then I would be in favor of proceeding. Okay. Mr. Loeb, I uh, agree. I would like to proceed. Okay. Now, if the process is to declare it surplus, mm -hmm. that's fine. But I don't think I should slow us down in the other areas because I can't imagine everybody not supporting it. And okay. But I would like to get the uh, a clean bill of health too. So at least the baseline of where we stood. I, th I think Mary can put something in a contract that's going to protect the county's future liability and risks and if they're willing if Perkins is willing to accept that in a contract then maybe we can advance the sale we'll advance the sale Mr. Conover uh, I uh, I think it's fine move to move forward with that but I think for Ryan and Kevin and Mary uh, I think you know we're, here, we're hearing snippets of different reports and different things and the first thing you do in something like this is to do what's called a literature search uh, it's kind of a level one right that I think that the three of you should uh, give the sheriff guys make an appointment to sit down, not telephone, sit down with uh, folks from DEC and just review with them what they believe the status of this property is so that we can get a, uh, a report as to what 
they feel the um, the status of this property is. It'd be nice to have it from them in writing, if, if possible. Um, I don't think it would take long to do that, but I would I would strongly recommend that because <coughs> you know there's a lot of history that's gone on here that none of us were involved in, and but I'm sure that those records exist in one file over at DC. <coughs> it would be good for the buyer as well to know where we are with the property and, and exactly what the conditions are, why those conditions exist as they do. Um, I, I would strongly recommend it. Mr. McGowan. I, I, I agree with uh, Chairman Conover there, uh, but I'm a little confused with the DEC and the EPA. Now, a super fund, who is in charge of the super fund? Well, the EPA or the EPA? <laughs> DEC. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to get with them, my ABCs? <laughs> but, I mean, the EPA, don't, don't they? Fund the super fund? Aren't they in charge of that? They are, yes. So, I mean, the DEC might not be able to get as, as much. Do we need both, both people there? DEC and EPA so we don't have any crossover or missing anything. I, I would think so. That would be my guess. Defer to counsel. Thank you, Peter. I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> counsel? Harvey, <laughs> <Barbie. laughs> not being <laughs> Can you ask me again? <laughs> oh, you want me to ask again? Yes, please. <laughs> we want you to bang. Did someone record me? But no, I, my, my question is, do you, should we get the EPA and the DEC there? together. I, I was a little confused when you want to bring in the DEC, but the EPA was actually on the, on the super fund. So. Um, my suggestion would be to get, the, to get both the state and federal agency. If you want sign off, you're going to want sign off from both. <coughs> okay. And the sign -off, and just to add to that, the sign off would be married that a sale is appropriate with conditions? I don't think they'll ever issue a statement like that. I think the only statement they would issue is don't we've paper. remediated, we've changed it to a class two, three, four, five, right. Um, right. but they're not going to sign off on a sale. Okay, I, uh, I think we have a consensus in regards to the sale of property. Should we take that next step and, and declare this property um, what was it? not necessary for public use not necessary for public use I think that's what you were looking for Ask on the full board, full board? Correct. move to the full board so there's a recommendation to move that to the full board yes we need a motion for that or just a there's a motion I'll make a motion second we'll all in favor all right. motion carries thank you okay um, But we'll talk about that. Right. Okay. Motion to adjourn. But before we adjourn, I'd like to thank this committee for being patient. Um, and I believe that the Facilities Committee has done a lot of good work this calendar year, and, and you deserve some recognition. It started with the um, fixed base operator contract. And we're making headway with this particular site, what we're going to do. It looks like, you know, if things work out, we'll be able to sell a property. But thank you for your patience and your hard work to share. So, thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs>